All righty, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Zen Meathead podcast. As always, Chris and Sarah with you. And today we have a friend in the house uh, who, what has it been, a year, 18 months we've been talking about doing this? Two years. Two years. So you are a Buddhist monk, Linus. Yeah, that's correct. A uh, Soto Zen monk uh, in the Japanese uh, lineage of uh, Japanese Zen Buddhism. Wow. Okay. Um, so, so much I have to learn and break down. So, um, Buddhist monk, um, however, you have worked in big tech quite a yes. bit. So when I think of monks, Buddhist or otherwise, um, I envision predominantly men in robes, um, who to best of my understanding had taken, uh, vows of celibacy and, you know, they, they live in a temple, they spend all day, uh, praying, studying mm. scripture, whatever it is, um, that is obviously not the route that no, you have it's gone. it's not the route I've gone. Um, and it's not really the route uh, uh, modern Zen has gone either. And uh, it's a bit of an historical accident. Um, traditionally, Zen, just like most Buddhist orders, would be celibate, they would be living in monasteries, would be living in retreat places. Um, but this has to do with Japanese history. Uh, so during the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, the shogun basically decided that you have to marry. So it went from being basically monks to more priests. So maybe a more accurate word would be Zen priest rather than Zen monk. Oh. Um, but I don't know, rules uh, in terms of uh, uh, celibacy. Um, we're expected to be in the world and work in the world. And you go for retreats and you go for practice periods, but you're expected to take life as the practice. Wow. Yeah. And from that perspective, it's no conflict being in tech or whatever. Yeah. 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 So... When did you start this in life? How did you? End I up in was it? 16 years old and started practicing Shaolin Kung Fu um, with some monks from the temple in China. And I've been watching way too many Kung Fu movies. <laughs> and I wanted to get good at beating people up. <laughs> and uh, I asked them, you know, how do you get good at this? And they basically told me that, oh, you're too old. You should have started when you were five. <laughs> but, you know, you can meditate. That might help you. Okay, would you teach me? And so, yeah, sure, come here five o'clock in the morning and we'll teach you. So every day for a year uh, before school, I biked to the temple, uh, sat with them, and I just fell in love. It was coming home. And I never stopped. Wow. So that, that's how I got started. So 16 years old, um, you got involved with it. Uh, at some point, I'm going to guess that there's, you know, to reach the level that you have, it's not so simple as just showing up at the temple and saying, hey, I want to learn to kick ass. No, meditation is more your style. Um, how do you move forward in this system? Because obviously um, you've been doing it your whole life now. Yeah, better part. Um, you just keep, keep at it. Um, I mean, in the beginning, you think a lot about outcomes and results and attainments of various sorts and um, awakening, enlightenment, all of these big words. Um, what do they even mean, really? Um, just keep practicing and um, kind of bleeds into your life. It subtly changed your life. Um, it's not very dramatic, but it's also extraordinary. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, my darling. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not a very good answer, but ah, yeah. that was brilliant. Oh, that's an awesome answer. We're going to jump all over the place. I, yeah. I love the fact that violence was the path to peace. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be able to beat people up. So. Yeah, hey, we were 16. Well, I mean, most of us <laughs> want to at that age. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you say Zen Buddhism, um, but there are obviously different types, different, uh, are they considered sects? Like, they would be, and of course I could talk about all the different schools and traditions and uh, give an academic discourse, but uh, uh, that, that, that would be somewhat pointless. People can read Wikipedia or you know, okay. read, read a book about it. Um, also, that, that, that won't really uh, have too much impact on anyone's life. Yeah. Um, it, it'll reach the level of the intellect, and you know, that's helpful at a certain level, but uh, uh, the rubber doesn't really hit the road there. Um, and that's where the practice part is maybe more important and more, more relevant, I'd say. And the practice. So we, we met uh, through a mutual friend who happens to be in the studio off in the background here. Hi, Beth. Hi, Beth. Um, so Beth had hit us up and, you know, knew that we were on a, a journey of enlightenment, if you will, <laughs> um, and mentioned that she had this meditation group that she was part of and she was working with this 
Buddhist monk um, that was running these meditations. And that's how we met online doing these meditations. I think actually we started maybe during COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was during the COVID. I got very busy. Yeah. 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 Now, the practice. So in all the work that we've done, uh, that word is becoming really, really relevant. What does that look like or mean for you? Life. How to live. How to conduct yourself. uh, How to face life. Um, And it never ends. And... um, this whole day of enlightenment, of attainment, it signifies that you get to a point, you have an experience, and everything is fine and dandy afterwards. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, I never met anyone who ended up uh, having that one experience and they stopped. Right. And um, if they do or say they did, uh, I don't necessarily believe it. <laughs> I think it's very much an ongoing thing. And I think it's a matter of making peace with a lot of things. Uh, I remember Reb Anderson, who used to be uh, the abbot for San Francisco Sun Center. Um, so podcast with him, and uh, he said when he was young, he practiced very hard, and he wanted to attain enlightenment, like everyone does when they start out. It's the ultimate fantasy of the ego. It's the, the ultimate dream. You're going to be safe, you're going to be perfect, you're going to be better than everyone else, you're going to cover everything with you. Universe shall become you, and you're supreme, you're God. Uh, that's the ego's delusion, right? Um, and he set out, and he practiced, and he kept failing. He, he never really got there. His mind was never really still. His thoughts kept popping up. His emotions kept affecting him. He kept messing up life, because we all do. Um, and he, he kept feeling it. He kept making mistakes. And then after 50 years of practice, he looked back and said, and my whole life since has been one long, continuous mistake. And then he left. And that's it. Right. Yeah. We just keep at it. We just keep sitting. We keep practicing. And give up these ideas of attainment, of getting there, because we won't. When when have we ever gotten anywhere? Okay, so we attain something, we get a promotion, we meet the right person, we win the jackpot, and then wake up the next day, life goes on, and then something happens, or mom dies, we have an accident, we got a promotion, someone moves abroad, whatever, life goes on. It's, it's not static. It doesn't stop. And that implies that practice also must follow life. Roll with the punches. So we don't get to get to that end point of done, done and dusted, sit on your holy mountain and smile and look <laughs> benign and happy and sprout wisdom or whatever you want to call it. Right, reach inner yeah. peace. Yeah. <laughs> inner peace. It is, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- there is inner peace, but I- in my experience, and uh, my, mind you, I'm no, uh, <laughs> I've been at it for a while, um, <laughs> but some of my teachers, they've been at it for three decades more than me. And they would say that, you know, I'm a beginner. And <laughs> we're all beginners. Um, and uh, and the, there is inner peace, um, but they seem to be a bit counterintuitive. So the more we let go and the more we surrender, the more we let go of looking for anything, the more it's just there. Yeah. That, that seems to be the equation. Like Meister Eckhart said, the more there is of me, the less there is of God. The more there is of God, the less there is of me. So surrender, let go, and let everything take care of itself and fall into place. And then there is peace. Then there is tremendous stillness. There is joy. There is beauty. And then the thinking mind usually comes in. Oh, I got it. I'm enlightenment. Ah, this is, I'm it. And then it's gone. Yeah. Hmm. You, uh... And the practice is to keep coming back to that letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go of expectations, of preference, of, you know, of trying to win. We don't win. None of us will win. We're going to die. Yeah. Everything we do at best is writing our names with a stick in water. Nothing will last. This planet won't last. This galaxy won't last. Uh, if science is to believe it, it's going to be the heat death of the universe. You know, Even that's going to fade out, Hawking's radiation and whatnot. So, yeah, we don't win. Yeah. And sitting and practicing is also facing that. How do you sit with this knowledge of the fact that you won't make it? That's something we all have to make peace with. Oh, well, we can choose not to. We can rage against it and, you know, uh, try to outmaneuver it, but we won't. No one succeeds. Yeah. And that's practice, facing that and dealing with that Well, it's and fasc- accepting that. It's fascinating because, you know, uh, I spent the majority of my younger years up, honestly, up until fairly recently, um, I guess kind of in a, del- a delusion uh, I wasn't even thinking about that. It was always just the next best thing. You know, I've got to, like you said, I got to get that promotion, that next vehicle, yeah. that next, yeah. next thing, thing, next hit, next thing, yeah. just yeah. chasing that next hit constantly. And 
I remember when I first started to sit down um, and work intentionally on meditation, yeah. how incredibly frustrating it was. And still, you know, it, yeah. it, it, there are better days and worse days, but the noise in, in my mind and trying to calm that down. And like you said, just surrender, just experience, observe, as opposed to being focused on the outcome or trying to affect yeah. it. Yeah. And also when we start to sit, in the beginning it's usually very fine and dandy and blissful. Everything is kind of, yeah, I'm feeling peaceful, this is great, I want to meditate forever. And then there's this part where things just fall apart and we start to notice I'm quite mad. My mind is all over the place, I have absolutely no control, I'm just you know, falling down the hill uh, uh, in a barrel and it's just <laughs> not, not very sustainable. <laughs> but the difference is we're not madder than we were before, we're just noticing it. Uh, and that's when the practice actually starts to bear fruit because it's like, yeah, this is not great, <laughs> you know. And we can start to work with it because we've seen it. You can't work with something you haven't seen. And then the next step is to have a little bit of distance to it. So you're not squished up against the window. You have a little bit of distance. So you won't freak out too much. You have a little bit of maneuver space. And then you can start to transform it or let go or accept it or whatever you need to do. And that's when the peace starts to happen. But without seeing, without having distance, we have no choice but following our source code. We just programmed meat robots. Keep doing the same thing. Yeah. Living in the matrix. Well, it's interesting to me because, you know, the little bit of experience I've had with you uh, and with, with you as well, Beth, watching you, uh, for lack of better terms, I'm sorry, grow up, um, mature, whatever you want to say, um, you watch people around you that seem to have a little more figured out. Um, and it it occurs to me that people that have a, a solid and consistent practice of depth do seem to deal with the noise and the pressure and the stress of life better than myself or others, perhaps. Do you, you know, yes, it's not necessarily enlightenment, but, you yeah. know, I would look at you and think that you probably have a more peaceful experience day to day than I do. Could be. Um, is that just a function of that just continual intentional time investment? I think what seems to happen uh, with practices when we go into a space of stillness, uh, we let go for ourselves. And there's a, a sense saying that awakening can be a bit like walking with your robes in dewy, wet grass. They get wet without you noticing it. It, it seeps into you. So uh, when, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. And it's the same with stillness. You, you sit in this space, it suffuses you, becomes a part of you, whether you want or not. And eventually there is less of you and more of that stillness and it starts flowing through you into the world. And it's nothing to do with you. Yeah. Because it comes back to that the question of letting go of you. Because it's only then it's actually possible. From my experience. And mind you, all of this is just from my experience, my limited point of view. I'm no authority on anything. I'm just a guy that's sitting. In intensely humble you are. No, <laughs> but that, that, that's my actual assessment. That's, uh, <laughs> I, I don't have any answers. I, I just have my take on certain things. And, uh, but, but that seems to be the case. And um, I heard the same from my teachers. Uh, um, and they, they would be the first to say that I have nothing figured out. I know nothing. Uh, and in fact, I was listening to, uh, listened to a podcast yesterday with uh, 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 one of them. And uh, he has a favorite saying. He's a Christian mystic. And he says that uh, um, God knows and I don't. And then he goes on and saying that, you know, uh, not knowing is a higher form of knowing. Because it doesn't try to control anything, doesn't compete with anything, there are no levels, there is no game to play. And the only winning move is basically not to play that game. Because the second you do, you're back in that little world of comparison, getting the next hit and chasing the dragon, your own tail, and having all the stress and anxiety and misery and hopes and fears. Yeah, comparing yourself to Yeah, other comparing yourself. And, and you can never win. Because, no. so what? Okay, you may be, you know... Uh, the richest man or woman in the world uh, for now and then your company tanks and the stock goes down and you're not and someone else takes the crown and you know yeah it doesn't stay does it, it doesn't matter. stay in place yeah yeah i mean ask all those god emperors of uh, yore and all the great rulers of history and the popes and the saints and you know, dust their bone yeah. doesn't last same fate that we all are going to yeah yeah, and you only last as long as the last person who remembers you. Yeah. So at that point, it doesn't matter. Societal death, the last time someone says your name. Yeah. No. 
I love and I'm an archaeologist originally, so I had a bit of uh, oh. experience with that when you're holding a skull. And, you know, who is this? Right. Who was this? Alas, poor Yorick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, there was something that you said in one of the meditations that I actually have written down a number of times in the house. Um, <laughs> there's. <laughs> it's on my whiteboard, I think. Yeah. What does it say? <clears throat> you cannot storm the gates of heaven. You oh. Can... <laughs> only surrender. You can only surrender. Uh. I remember we we finished that meditation that day and both of us were like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> but that seems to be the equation. The more we try to storm the gates of heaven, we're just going to beat ourselves bloody against the battlements. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. I yeah. Mean, that, that's a usual strategy. Yeah. yeah, it seems to happen as a, a uh, I don't want to say a natural part of aging, but it seems to be the farther we get toward our inevitable demise yeah. the hope is that we can let go of some of the attachments to the things and the situations and you know they talk about like getting into your 40s and 50s and yeah. and having less fucks to give yeah. um and and how there's so much more peace in that experience and coming into almost my 50s that does feel very real yeah. that if I can let go of what things mean yeah. and my place in them and just try and be humble and present and experience things, it yeah. helps. It, it, uh, it takes the sting away. It does. Yeah. It really does. That's surrendering mm -hmm. and letting go. And it doesn't mean that we have to be cold and uncaring and aloof. In fact, in my experience, it's the exact opposite. It's only then we actually can start to care for real. Mm -hmm. Because before, we don't really care about people. We use people or situations or whatever. They're stepping stones to whatever we want to achieve to you know, feel secure, loved, safe, successful, whatever it is. But when you start to give up all of that, you just stop playing that game. You can see people as they are, or situations as they are, and appreciate it. And then it's an appreciation without attachment. And even if it's something beautiful, something joyful, something deeply meaningful, you know it's not going to last. And that's what we appreciate even more because yeah. you know it's not going to last. And it's only really there it gets its value. Because imagine if you had a fantastic situation, the perfect evening, and it went on forever. That would be hell very quickly. Right. That would be absolute yeah. and utter hell. Welcome to night number 1,500, <laughs> Groundhog right. Day. With no deviation whatsoever. Yeah, no deviation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That would be torment yeah. i can't think of a worse hell actually it would be like uh being on the beach always yep. and never being able to like be cool yep. and feel that feeling of difference yep. yeah yeah talking to the same people doing the same thing going through the same motions and perversely from the ego's perspective it seemed to <laughs> that seemed to be what he craves this security this predictability uh, this ability to control things um but it very quickly becomes suffering deeply unpleasant yeah. Whereas if we let things be, they come and go. We appreciate them when they're here. We cherish them when they're gone. And we prepare ourselves for the next experience. Then we ride the waves of life. We don't get dragged down or crushed. Yeah. And then you can find peace in the movement. Stuff doesn't last. I mean, I'm in Seattle now. I was in Ireland a few days ago. Uh, I'm going to be in England next month. Um, God knows where. Uh, the month after that. We, we don't know what the future holds. But it comes and goes. Yeah. And this coming and going seem to be one of the major characteristics of life. It arises from who knows where. It lasts for a moment and gone. And who knows where it goes. Keep saying or using the word God. And I'm curious. Um, yeah, it's, it's just... Uh, th that's what happens when you study with a Christian mystic for a bit. <laughs> uh, uh, mind you, he, he knows I'm Buddhist. And uh, uh, I have to sometimes explain what that entails to him. It's like, yeah, sounds about the same. Well, it's interesting. Um, Sarah and I have noticed a lot. We've talked about it quite a bit. Um, whether you're talking to a Christian, a Buddhist, yeah. an atheist, a scientist, um, everybody has a different lexicon that they use. Yeah. But it seems like the underlying concepts are very similar. Mm -hmm. That's my experience, too. Very often with these things. It's pointing in the same direction, pointing towards the same thing. And... In a way, it's wordless. I mean, if you have a experience in meditation, if you put it into words, it's not going to be 100% accurate. You can't really put it into words. And very often when I lead meditations, I get to a point where it's not worth saying anything else because 
you can't. It, it won't add anything to it. You just have to keep people in that zone, and that's it. Um, so at the level of form, at the level of words, we have to use words, and then we tend to use whatever uh, we have from our upbringing, our background, our culture, uh, religions we grew up with or didn't grow up with, um, people we were exposed to, uh, books we read, and so on. It's going to be pretty unique for every person, and words means different things for different people, obviously. And it can be quite sensitive, uh, especially words like God, for example. It's quite charged. I but I'm from. Struggled with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know yeah, a lot of people do. Faith. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I'm from Sweden, and we're probably the most secular country in the world. So for me, it, it cares nothing. It, it's a word, and it's a useful word for me. But uh, when I talk to my Irish friends, for them it's a different kettle of fish because oh. they grew up um, with a uh, certain oppression. Yeah, yeah I uh, when you talk about surrender and and um, all that that entails, there for someone like me. Um, I, for a long time, really equated safety with the lack of surrender and this yeah. idea of always being on guard and always... Uh, Cover all grounds. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so the idea of surrender to me was so um, antithetical to my safety for a long yeah. time. And I know that there are sometimes feelings uh, of similar ilk around religion and the idea of surrendering to a faith or yeah. an idea. Um, how, how do you guide people through letting go of that baggage so that they have the opportunity to experience this in, in that way? Just drop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you can make stories about it, then, but then you're back in that little realm of playing games again. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get rid of this problem by creating another situation that's going to be... And you're in the realm of dualism. Just drop it. Yeah. Just open your hand of thought and let it go. Come back to your posture. Come back to your breath. Let that thought go. Let the thought pattern go. It's a story. Because all these words and concepts, um, what are they really... What, what substance do they actually have? Except for what we give now. Look at thoughts. What are they? Where, where are they coming from? In the, I'm not talking about, you know, from... A, a, a medical point of view or anything like that, but from an experiential point of view yeah. observe a thought where are the thoughts of yesterday yeah where are the thoughts in five minutes it's intellectual flatulence yeah exactly it really it's, it's just it's brain just, farts yeah <laughs> it, it, it makes an impact and then it's gone yeah my son teacher often says this calls it it's yeah. farts of the brain huh? it's french <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah mental farts mm -hmm. and you know don't care about it let them come and go uh, and this is very much the practice as well, and let everything just come and go. Attend what needs attending to. And we have to still attend to things. We, we live in a, uh, a context where people who rely on us, we rely on people. We have to survive, we have a body we have to take care of, we have work we have to do, uh, we have a world to take care of. Um, stuff will arise, and it needs to be attended to. You, know? you need to cook, you need to clean, uh, put out the fire if it starts somewhere. Um, yeah, but then let it go. It's a beautiful saying. I think it was uh, Suzuki Roshi in San Francisco. They said, be like a good bonfire and burn until not even ashes remain. Mm. And this has been my personal practice for a few years. Um, so when you do something, you do it fully with your whole being. You don't think about what you did yesterday, what you're going to do in the future. You just do it. And when it's done, it doesn't exist anymore. And you don't care about the result or the outcome. There is no outcome because it's gone. You don't get to experience that. Well, something may arise in the future, but then you meet that with the same mindset. And then that's going to disappear. And then you just attend what needs attending to. So basically, if I'm following you, it's the goal or intention is 100% presence all the time. You're not living in the future. You're not living in the past. It's you're addressing the present moment because that's all there is. <sighs> Well, I mean, if you talk about goals, it's still something you project into the future. You need a future for a goal. So drop the goal. Just do it. Just attend what needs attending to. Don't, don't care about the goal or the outcome. When you're thirsty, drink. When you're hungry, eat. When you need to go to the loo, go to the loo. When you need to stretch your legs, go for a walk. When you're tired, sleep. When you need to go to work, you go to work. It's funny, I, I find um, just almost like a physical like <laughs> response. That it's, it's so antithetical to what... Uh, it's stupid simple. It, it, it's, right. it's, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's too simple because, you know, it's, you know, 
the way that I was raised here, you know, it's like you you go to school and you focus on this and you make plans and you go to college and you get all this stuff. And you're always, like you said, always working towards that future goal. Yeah, because our entire system is based on the future goal. It's um, it's a bit like, uh, you know, uh, the the, the rapture is going to come one day and everything is going to be fine and done. But it's in the future. So it's permanently unattainable because it's in a place we will never experience. We will never experience the future. So we work for something that we never get to experience. It's pretty idiotic, yeah. actually. Just wasting your time. We're dooming ourselves to suffering. It, um, the way we that can't attain it. Yeah. yeah. And we put all this effort and all this energy into something that's impossible to attain. It's quite daft, <laughs> frankly. Yeah. But that's what everything is built on, our economy and whatnot. And frankly, if people stopped, it would, <laughs> it would fall, apart. fall apart very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So this would probably be one of the more revolutionary things you could do in life and society. Stop. Mm-hmm. Stop and just be. Yeah, don't don't wake up. Yeah, yeah. It uh, the way that it was described to me that I really liked was um, imagine being on an airplane. Mm. Um, If you never allow yourself to arrive, if you're always traveling, then you never get to experience being somewhere. You're Mm. always in transit, and so where is the joy in always being on the airplane? Yeah, unless you're fully in the airplane. Right. And then you start to appreciate that you're on the airplane. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you sit in your seat and uh, the two big guys squeeze, squeezing against <laughs> you. And one of them is flatulent and a child is screaming somewhere and you're watching some crappy movie. And hopefully they will serve you another beer. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of miserable. But, you know, then you're in that moment because anything else is resistance. Ah, oh, this is terrible. I wish I could arrive faster. Mm-hmm. And then the suffering starts. And then you're in this loop and it becomes quite unbearable very fast. Yeah. Uh, but if you're full in the airplane, yeah, this is my experience now. It doesn't last. And this is the beauty. Nothing lasts. It's a blessing and a curse. Nothing lasts. Yeah. And these unbearable situations don't last either because the plane lands and you get off and uh, you're walking around in some, you know, airport and buy some crap food somewhere and wait at the next gate to go through security and, you know, would ask whatever questions. And, and then you're in a taxi and you go somewhere and... People appear and disappear, and now I'm here, and tomorrow I'm going to be somewhere else. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But nothing lasts, nothing stays still. And I find it to be quite <laughs> quite nice, actually. Yeah, it's uh, comforting. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. And also, it's, it seems to be how life itself operates. I mean, if you look at an acorn, if an acorn was always you know, permanent, it would never grow into an oak. And that oak wouldn't grow and eventually become mulch to feed other trees or other organisms. It just goes on. Mm-hmm. It's constant movement. And life seems to be constant movement. The yeah. universe seems to be constant movement. I'm using a lot of big words here, uh, but, <laughs> yeah, you know. It's, uh, it's fascinating to sit and listen to you because it sounds, you know, the way you describe it, it's just like, <sighs> sounds it's delightful. Like, it's nothing special. It's stupid simple. Uh, yet... Um, and I, it's the interesting thing to me. It's it's uh, such a challenge. I, I I find myself like getting into the pocket, as I like to call it. It's a surfing term. We're really into wake surfing. Mm. You get into that like Zen spot where the board will just maintain you and hold you, and you just get into this like flow state, and just like yeah. everything else disappears. Yeah. And it's so such a wonderful experience. Yeah. Um, but I am so susceptible to you know. Today I came home from work. I found myself like. I was hollering at my cat in the house because he was meowing at me because I was so like anxious and frustrated about the stuff that I was dealing with at work. Yeah. And I like, finally stopped myself like, dude, you're literally yelling at this cat that you adore and love because you're frustrated about some crap that you shouldn't have been frustrated about in the first place. And that happens to all of us. And this is where the practice part comes in. So we're not perfect. We're going to fuck up quite often, quite regularly. You know, it's a long, one long continuous mistake. <laughs> um, but we get better at that mistake. We maybe do a little bit less damage with every every time as we keep practicing. Uh, maybe we don't uh, holler at the cat, you know, uh, every month. Maybe it's just uh, once a year kind of thing. Eventually, we might stop even completely. <laughs> and then we'll yell at something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But then we work our way through that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, yeah. The, at the one hand. Maybe there is no such thing as improvement, but at the other hand, there seems to be uh, improvement as we practice. It seeps into us. It becomes what the new world. It's like a perfume, in a way. 
do you have a like a defined practice? Because as as I've been starting down this, like you know, yeah. meditation is an example. Yeah. Um, intentionally sitting, you know, like setting a yeah. goal. Yeah, here we are again. But you know, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna sit. No, but sometimes you need to do that to get, to started. get started. It's a tool. Yeah. yeah. Um, Whatever floats your boat. You know, I talk with more experienced practitioners, and they start to talk about. You know, I, I had meditated for an extended period of time, you know, daily and this and that. And they start to like, hey, you know, start focusing on your breath when like you're driving or when you're at work. Like start to kind of like tune into that energy, like make your life your practice as opposed to having to like dedicate special time and a special yeah. location. Yeah. Um, but if you don't start with that special time uh, and techniques, you probably won't have the ability to make life into practice. It'd be too overwhelming. You wouldn't, coming back to what I said before about having that little bit of distance, you don't have it. And you don't have the muscles and the capacity to actually deal with it. So you're just going to go with the flow and get beaten up. Yeah. Until you have a bit of technique. And once you master the technique and uh, master it, it's a word, <laughs> but you know, you get it to work. Um, then you can start to drop it. And then everything can become practice. And then it can be as simple as, you know, feel your heartbeat, you know, feel your breath, feel the seat on your chair, your feet on the ground. Just feeling your feet on the ground, that's a great practice. But unless you practice something formal for a bit and have a bit of ability, maybe it won't work that well. Or maybe for some people it will work immediately. It's also very individual. Yeah. But that's a practice I use very often when I'm in the office, uh, walking from meetings to meet, meeting room to meeting rooms. Um, just how does it feel to walk? What's the experience of lifting one leg and putting down the other and just walking? How does that feel with no judgment? It's not about whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. It's just what's the actual experience of walking? What's the actual experience of sitting, of talking, of eating and drinking? How does that feel? Attend to the actual experience before the story. Because often we have a lot of stories to things. Mm -hmm. No, this is great or this is terrible or whatever, but you know... What's the actual experience? How does cold feel? How does heat feel? How does damp feel? Yeah. How does uncomfortable feel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you don't make it into a story, it's just an experience. Discomfort is just another experience. Yeah. Just as comfort is an experience, neither of them will last, but you know, go into that experience. And then it's almost like diving into the eye of the storm, go into something very uncomfortable. But if you're in the heart of it and accept it and there's no resistance, they say, oh, interesting. Yeah, my body's quite tense and my heart is beating and I can feel a bit of nerves and someone is screaming at me. Fascinating. <laughs> but that's not going to last forever. I'm going to run out of breath eventually. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then something else happens. Yeah, it occurs to me that we make things so much harder than they need to be. <laughs> yeah, but this seems to be the defining character of our ego. It loves Humanity. complexity. Yeah. Uh, and you said, uh, you, you talked about simplicity and uh, uh, complexity. Um, the ego loves to make it complex. Uh, it can't be this simple. It's got to be 15 different layers and special techniques. And you have to go to a monastery in Nepal or a mountain somewhere and go to a desert for 40 days or whatever you choose. Pick a poison. Uh, we make the story. We, we curse ourselves to never attain it because, okay, I, I've done most of those things. I've been in monasteries in Nepal and, you know, done retreats and all that. And, then you still face the exact same you. Yeah. yeah. You're sitting with the same thoughts, except you're in a monastery in Nepal and you probably have a dodgy stomach. Congrats. You can't talk to anybody because you don't know the language. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you're still you. Yeah. It's still now. It's still here and now. Uh, and that struck me many years ago. I was living in China and I was flat broke. I was down to six bucks in life savings. I had no prospects. Didn't speak Chinese yet. Um, I had a degree in archaeology. I wasn't exactly uh, a hot potato on the job market <laughs> uh, in Beijing. Uh, and I was dirt poor. And I was missing my then ex terribly. I felt I made a mistake of my life. Also, I turned on a full scholarship, full paid scholarship for a year because I was an idiot. Um, but then it struck me. I was walking on the street and it's like, it's just here now. Regardless of where I go, it's just this moment. And I just kept walking and I never left that moment. It's like, shit, this is it. It's just one moment to ever manage, one, mo one place to ever manage, and it's just here now. What a gift. Where else could you go? Mm -hmm. You never get out of it. We can't go anywhere but now. We can't get anywhere but here. Mm. And that's super manageable. Because we just have to meet it and, you know, 
attend to what needs attending to. Yeah, basically try yeah. not to die. <laughs> yeah, and if we die, we die. That's going to be another experience. Yeah. And if we mess up, we mess up. Then we <laughs> try to do better next time. But, you know, that's also another experience. And mistakes don't last. Mm-mm. Success don't last. Is that to say, um, again, this, this sounds just uh, heavenly to me. Um, is that to say that you don't necessarily make future plans or goals yourself? I do, um, but I treat them more as setting a course. So I kind of know what I want to have out of life, what kind of life I want to live. Um, So I set a direction, but if I don't succeed with my specific goals, okay, go somewhere else and explore and see what happens there and still keep traveling in the general direction. Um, But I'm not very emotionally involved with uh, the goals, if that makes sense. If I succeed, that's fine. If I don't succeed, that's also fine. Because we've got to organize our life some way. You know, where we wake up in the morning. What are we going to do with our time? And some people are perfectly fine to do nothing. And that's fine for them. But I happen to be one of those people that like to do things. And um, then I just, what I want to do, okay, I want to do this. I want to read these books. I want to travel to these places, have these experiences, put up these challenges for myself because it's fun to put challenges to myself. This is what I want to accomplish for work. But... I may fail, well, that's fine. It's just setting a direction, and I don't care about the outcome. Because once again, then you're back in the future, and yeah. that's never gonna arrive. So you're never gonna actually attain anything. Because you just have now, and now, and now. My mind is just kind of melting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's nothing special, really. I, it really I disagree. isn't. It's simple, but it's special. I don't know. It's available to every single person on the planet. Yes. You, you how need beauty. Tap into it. Yeah, and that's the thing. Uh, yeah, we haven't been taught. No one has showed us that A, this is a possibility, and B, this is how you do it. Because it's not difficult. It really isn't. Yeah. Uh, I've been teaching meditation for about 10 years now, a uh, bunch of years in corporate. Uh, you guys know I'm running a project, a program for Microsoft, uh, teaching Google. Oracle, uh, LinkedIn, a whole bunch of other companies and universities and whatnot. And in my experience so far, it seemed to take six months to a year for people to get it, enough to be able to stand on their own two feet with this kind of practice. And it's nothing special. It's easy. It doesn't cost anything. You don't need no degree. You don't need to go to any special place. In fact, whatever happens to be your life will be your practice. And that's going to be very different for each and every one of us. I want to bring you to Xbox. I'll be happy to. <laughs> All right. I'm a gamer. <laughs> uh, I just I just started working for the Halo team, so. Cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. We sell talk. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's the same way you play video games. I mean, you can play. Uh, you can play to win. Uh, you, you can make video game a real source of suffering, especially if you compete with others, and you know you have winners and losers and all of that. Just and, pull you know. the plug in the middle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you just play, mm-hmm. and Weirdly enough, if, if you just play, you tend to get better at it. Mm-hmm. Because all that energy that we have worrying about whether we're going to succeed or not is challenging to just doing. Yeah, the pure joy of it. The pure joy. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with work. If we fully attend what we need to attend to without thinking about the outcome, we're probably going to do a better job. Yeah. And that incidentally is probably going to ironically give us a better result <laughs> than yeah. if we try to actually attain a better result. Life become a life of blessings in a way. I love uh, it. I don't know where it came from, but the idea that if we can find the fun yeah. in anything, like that's how we win at life. Yeah. And especially in those moments of like struggle and difficulty, like if you can figure out how to have fun yeah. in the face of that, like that's that's the way to win it. Absolutely you're gonna, right. You're going to share your line. Which one? Put the fu in fun. Oh well, <laughs> put the fun in dysfunctional. Yeah, all of don't those we? All, don't we all? <laughs> right. What would you say um, the most rewarding part of your journey so far has been for you? Uh, this moment and this nice. moment and this moment. Perfect. I no, but that. what else? <laughs> It's, uh, it's a constantly changing scenery, kaleidoscope of experiences coming and going, and every moment is unique. And, you know, yeah. There's nothing to add to it, really. 
Uh, uh, what you said about struggle and play, I, I think that's a very spot on observation. Um, we have a choice. We seem to have a choice. Uh, we can make life very grim. Um, a lot of struggle. We attain something. We claw our way onwards and upwards. We're terrified of losing. We're looking at everyone on our sides because they're going to try to take our spots. And it's a battle. Mm-hmm. Or we can take the view of play. And it's a completely different experience. But we do the same thing, go through the same motion, we do the same actions. But one is misery and one is joy. Yeah. And this whole play thing comes back to we're not going to make it. And what else are you going to do but take it as play? <laughs> I, I have this maybe a bit of a, a morbid view, maybe, or image. Um, but imagine you, you're in one of those old war movies and you know, you've just been shot in the head by a sniper. Poof. Back of your head is gone. Your mm-hmm. brain just splattered and you get to take one or two more steps and then you're going to collapse. That's it. That's all of us. We're dead. We didn't make it. But we get to take a few more moments, a few more steps. And that's life. We didn't make it, so we have nothing to lose. And having nothing to lose means total freedom. We can do whatever the hell we want. Doesn't matter. Failing, <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> it's true. Seriously. Oh no, I got, lost my job. My boss hates me. And whatever, you know, yeah. And you're going to die. And you're going to die. All of us are. In fact, you already did. You just didn't notice it yet. It didn't really catch up with you yet. We started dying at birth. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, we have on the books, I don't know if, if we're going to like give this away, but Go ahead. we ahead. have, uh, an interview that is in the books on the record for talking with, uh, James Whitaker, who is really big in the AI and ML space right now. Cool. And, you know, this idea that we're, we're going to reach an inflection point at some point where yeah. we are more likely than not going to be able to take our consciousness past our living meat vehicle. Mm. Um, how does the practice of being present work with something like that? Like, because that's the, the exact opposite of, of being present. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would say I'm thinking of a meme where, where you have this guy in this room uh, being interviewed by a psychologist. Uh, the scholar is saying, uh, is that monster with you in the room right now? <laughs> <laughs> is that AI inflection with us in the room right now? Yeah. No. Will it ever exist? Maybe. Maybe. Who knows? We don't know. Maybe. Yeah. And will it be what we imagine to be? Who knows? I mean, if you look at AI two years ago, we wouldn't predict what it looks like right now. Yeah. It has changed incredibly fast. Maybe it's possible one day. Maybe not, but it doesn't really matter right now because we have now and now and now and now. And maybe one day that will be the case and then we have to deal with that, attend what needs attending to. But personally, I mean, we don't understand consciousness to begin with. And to bring, break that down into zeros and ones and data sets and whatever and train AI, I don't think it's very likely yeah. in the near future. Yet it is such a point of terror for so many these days. It's a hot button, yeah. It is. It is. It's, uh, it's changing a lot of things. It's shaking things up and forcing us to question what it means to be human. Yeah. Well, or professionals who are having a job. <laughs> right, that too. Yeah. And the idea, the thing that I keep getting hung up on is, is if we get to a point where we have to prove our value to another species, whether it's you know, uh, <laughs> man-made or otherwise looking back at the way that we've been up to this point, how are we going to, uh, justify us continuing to have our place with how shitty we've been as humans to other humans and other animals and the planet and all of this stuff? Like what's the value of keeping us around? Yeah, that's a good question for futurists and philosophers. <laughs> right. It? Yeah, but yeah, com- coming back to value and uh, uh, shitty and non-shitty and all of that, yeah, that's. Oh, we still have this one moment to deal with. Um, yeah. And every moment we can make that choice. And uh, I think in our times it's very easy to feel power powerless, overwhelmed. Uh, we have no control. Uh, forces are beyond our control. We don't know what's going to happen. It's it's chaos right now. 
you know, war in Ukraine, uh, situation in uh, Israel, China, Taiwan and whatnot, climate change, I can go on. But I think if we can ground ourselves individually um, and connect with this stillness that seems to be our human birthright, our human sanity, our basic goodness, because that's what it seems to be. Uh, you guys probably already had that experience. When you sit, you feel it's, it's just goodness. Mm -hmm. It's just love. But it's nothing to do with an object, and it's nothing to do with you, really. It's beyond all of that. It's bigger than all of that. And we all seem to have it. So if we connect with that, it will be like rings on water. We will affect people, whether we want to or not, and they will affect people, whether they want to or not, and it's rings and water. So just as so-called evil can be contagious, goodness definitely can be contagious, and then we can really affect the world. Yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's exactly the point of this podcast. Uh, and that's, that's very manageable and very controllable. Um, do I want to do something to make the world a better place? Yeah, here and now, what can I do? Yeah. I can choose to try to be kind or not. I can make that choice and maybe it will have absolutely zero effect on barking into the wind or maybe that word of kindness will affect someone who in turn pass it on. And I made up my philosophy uh, recently when I'm back to Microsoft to have that as my default mode, to just be kind to people. And it's incredible how people reciprocate. It really Boy, is life gets easy. You get help all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Infect people with your positivity, that's what I call it. Yeah, and it's, it's not even necessarily happy, clappy positivity, but authenticity, kindness, see, listening to people, seeing them. Caring. Caring, yeah. Mm -hmm. Seeing them as sentient beings with the same rights as myself and be there fully. And if you can make their animal's life easier, do it. The ring is on water. And I think that could actually change a lot of things for a lot of people. You know, a grassroots movement kind of way. Yes. It doesn't have any ideology, doesn't have any teachings, doesn't have any authority figures. It's just our own basic bloody sanity. Yeah. Reclaim that. Save the world. Save yourself. <laughs> Buy a 40-acre farm. <laughs> yeah. Ride off into the sunset. <laughs> well, and it, it, uh, it strikes me that that is kind of the root of... Um, I don't know, I like the golden rule, yeah. you know, like just be a decent human and try and help other people, yeah. treat other people as you want to be treated. And it's really like you don't have to get caught up in any of the other bullshit or nonsense. Just be decent. Yeah. Um, to the best of our abilities. And sometimes we don't have a lot of ability in certain situations. We get overwhelmed and yeah. all of that. But that's where the practice comes in. Mm -hmm. Fail a little bit less next time. <laughs> Be less unsuccessful. Yeah. <laughs> I did a meditation last week with a bunch of people from Microsoft, uh, and it was fairly intense meditation where you uh, look at personal relationships in life and uh, uh, friends, enemies, and neutral ones. There's no Tibetan technique called Tonglen. Um, and very often we have this saying, you know, Father, forgive them, they don't know what to do. Um, but they came to me, Father, forgive me, I didn't know what I do. And then I started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> because that's also, I have no clue. Many, many times I'm clueless. I have no idea, but I'm trying. Mm -hmm. and that's all we can do. Yeah, and recognizing that, like... Forgive yourself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. But also recognizing that people are really doing the best that they can. And that, you know, we may think that they should do something different, but they really are right at that point where that's the best that they could do, where they would do more. Mm. And so like meeting people where they are. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because in a given situation, we, we, we can't be holier than we are. <sighs> we can't be better than we are. We are what we are in this moment. Mm. We can have aspiration and the, the direction we travel in, but we can't be realistically stronger than we are in this moment. Can't lift more, whether we wish to or not. Um, uh, me and Beth, we have a good friend, uh, Tansin Tarpa, who is uh, uh, it's a student of the Dalai Lama. I've been a wandering monk for many, many years. And a guy you should consider having on this podcast. Yes. I think you've mentioned him. Yeah, he is he's brilliant. But he often says yes. that, you know, um, everyone, is, everyone is doing as good as they can mm -hmm. in every situation. And that, that's a very good reminder. Yeah. I find that to be very helpful hearing that. And it's good to bear in mind, you know, when you 
colleague or manager or someone is shouting at you, you know, they are in a situation, there are a lot of different factors at play. They probably wouldn't want to be that person. Very few people like to be the person that shouts at people. It doesn't feel good afterwards, and you probably are not proud of looking yourself in the mirror, but you did, and that happened. And they didn't know better, and they're trying in their ways. Yeah. And uh, is there room for so-called improvement? Yeah, I guess so. Always, for all of us. But we fail better. Fail better. Yeah. You have to keep that one around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ours has definitely been be less unsuccessful. <laughs> Which has yeah. been kind of a motto. I'm, I'm writing that down really quickly. Fail better. Yeah. Like it. I had one other topic that I wanted to uh, touch in on. Um, thank you, Beth, for this. Uh, something I've been curious about, uh, have not done much research on. Um and it sounds like it is a highly misunderstood subject. Ooh. Ooh. This sounds uh, like you could need another beer. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's pause this for half a second and get you a fresh beer. Yeah. So I hear about this all the time. Yeah. Tantra slash, uh, well, as I've always heard it, it's always sex related, tantric sex. Mm. But I've been informed that it's not it's necessarily practice, about that. Right? Or, yeah, let's, let's hear a little bit about what that's all about. Yeah, I mean... Um, you would have Tantra in both Buddhism and in Hinduism. Um, and then, of course, you would have more modern interpretations of Tantra, which uh, tend to have thrown away a lot of babies with a lot of bath waters. <laughs> um, but if you look at Buddhist Tantra, which would be the subject I'm the more familiar with, um, if you look at Zen or most Buddhist practices, it almost takes this approach of you kind of in the world, but you're not really in the world. There is a little bit of layer between you and experience. You're a little bit distant, a little bit shielded from it in a way. And you interact with it. You're part of it. can be very intimate, but you don't dive in. Whereas Tantra takes the approach of jump the hell right in, in the thick of it. Um, you work with the strong emotions. Uh, I remember reading in a book, um, the two strongest emotions in life is death and sex. It doesn't get stronger than that. Um, so if you want to transform yourself, it's like plugging yourself into a nuclear power, power reactor. There's going to be a lot of juice in there, but odds are you're going to burn quite bad if you don't know what you're doing. Mm. Um, because you start working with the strongest and deepest forces of the mind, basically. And uh, as an example, historically, uh, when Tantra started in India, um, the yogis, because it was typical yogis who practiced, uh, men and women, uh, they would go to the charnel grounds. And back in those days, the, the poor people, they were too poor to be cremated. So they tossed them well, somewhere in the forest and the animals would come eat it up. Um, so the yogis would go there and they would sit and meditate on rotten bodies. This is how you work with your fear of death. This is how you work with your aversion to disgusting physical whatever. Uh, they would engage in uh, rather gruesome practices, very symbolic practices, but seemingly very gruesome. But they had a, they had a meaning. They pointed towards something that was beyond the form, um, but it was a bit um, um, strong, so to say. Um, so it, it's, it's a different approach. So in some and other, practice, uh, other traditions, you hold back a bit, but here you dive in and you engage directly with it. And it's considered to be a very fast way to wake up uh, and also a tremendously dangerous way to wake up. So you would have a lot of safeguards, you have a lot of precepts, a lot of rules, a lot of regulations. It's typically a graduated par path, you get initiated, you would have a personal teacher that you're close to that would monitor you. So it, it, it's nothing, kids don't try this at home basically. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Not for the faint of heart. Not for the faint of heart. And I mean... Uh, it, I, I worked for numbers of years uh, leading tours uh, in the Himalayas, um, uh, Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, and these places. And you know they, they would have uh, bowls made of human skulls um, at home, and you know flutes made of thigh bones and drums made of skulls, damarus. They're not using them anymore. <laughs> yeah, I guess they. Yeah, just they, raw material. They are. Mm -hmm. They are. And I remember um, uh, someone got one of those bowls and. Uh, uh, my, my colleagues were quite excited uh, uh, because they don't see them uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And they run over and were standing in a circle. And I walk up and I was oh, look at this. Look at this skull. This person was a good person. You can see the cracks here. This is a, whole, this is a good bowl. We should, we should bring this home. <laughs> you stand there holding a skull in your hand. Yeah. Beautifully carved. 
It used to be belong to someone. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty useful piece. It, of it's the... pretty heavy metal, actually. Yeah. Tantra is quite heavy metal. It's, uh, it's death and rock and roll. Well, that, uh, oh. that, that leads into your question. A great segue. It's <laughs> not necessarily a question per se, but one of my favorite things that I've learned about you over our time uh, is that you have a, a great love of, of heavy metal. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How does that play in? Do you like? Um, do you listen to that while you meditate? Uh, I don't, but that would be an interesting experience, actually. Right. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, very often when I listen to, especially black metal and stuff like that, tend to be more longer songs, 15 minutes, quite melodic. Mm -hmm. You do enter a bit of a almost a meditative yeah. trace, uh, a stance, actually. Uh, who, who are you listening to right now? Who do you love? Uh, it's a great uh, American band called Black Braid. It's Native American black metal. Oh. It's fantastic. Uh, I listen to Norinir, uh, a German Viking metal band. Uh, Magala, Polish black metal band. Yeah, a whole bunch of them. Oh, I love it. Yeah. But uh, I find it fascinating. It's um, a lot of music allows us to peer into wor worlds and mindsets. And uh, very often we get dragged into it. We start to identify with it. But if you have that, you're rooted in this person, you're rooted in yourself, you can kind of go into that space without becoming that space. It's a good thing to explore, I think. Explore darkness. Yeah, because well, we all have it. It has a way of uh, seeping into you, even if you don't mean it to. Yeah, I love it. Music is a a, a, a thread that sp has always spoken to me very very deeply. And I remember being in high school and listening to like Headbangers Ball on Friday nights and just having a blast. <laughs> yeah, so, and it's fun. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's you fun. Can just let loose. I went to see a Polish metal band in Dublin recently, Vader. It's uh, one of the old uh, death metal bands, been around forever. Mm -hmm. Half the audience were 1% bikers, 25% were skinheads, and there was me and a few other guys. I was wild, but it was fun. Oh, it bet. was just unleashed raw passion. People were headbanging, crowd surfing. It was like, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> and I attended what needed attended to in that moment. And <laughs> then I went home and something else happened. Yeah. And yeah, life goes on. Uh, but it's a bit of spice, a bit of flavor, a bit of contrast. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think that's quite quite important, the contrasts. Um, Bart Marshall, an interesting self-inquiry uh, teacher I've been following for a while, he um, wrote a poem that it's only through the contrast that this uh, uh, aching, the, the aching beauty of life is discovered, or something to that effect. So we need those contrasts to shake things up a little bit. See what happens. Experiment. Press buttons. Push boundaries. Yeah, and fuck Explore. your assumptions. Yeah, fuck your assumptions. <laughs> and I, I remember a good friend of mine. He uh, is a long-time Zen practitioner. He was sitting a lot with a Zen teacher in Berlin, in Germany. And uh, that Zen teacher, on purpose, rented the Zen dojo next to a heavy metal studio. So people could learn to sit with that. Just relax. Oh Just my sit. Gosh. Give up any preference you have. It's going to be metal, a lot of it. Yeah, we uh, we were sitting doing a meditation um, a, a couple days ago. And, um, you know, when your cat starts cleaning himself mm. and we call it eating chili because it's the sound of an old man sitting in a corner eating chili. <laughs> and so and my my least favorite part is when the cat will sit next to me and I can feel him moving while mm. he's eating chili. Yeah. And whatever it is, it has this like visceral response for me. And he was doing that while we were meditating. And I was just giggling about the fact that the universe was going, oh, you want to meditate, huh? Yeah. Are you ready for chili eating? <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that great meditation practice? Yeah. Isn't that a great kindness of the universe? Throwing mm -hmm. things like that at you. Yeah. Throwing that construction work outside or that honking car, screaming child or barking dog or whatever. It's, it's great kindness. Yeah. It wakes us up. Yeah. If we don't identify with it, it makes us a story about how poor me and this is terrible and I'm suffering and all of that. It's a wake up call. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Something yeah. is happening. You engage with it. You sit with it. You attend to it. You present to it. You honor it. Yeah. And then it will disappear. It's... The cat will go away somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the moments Eating where chili. I look at him and I get frustrated and I'm like, 
damn it, I never know what to expect with you. And the second that I say it, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm not supposed to have expectations. I get <laughs> it. That's funny, universe. A fun thing to do uh, when that happens is who is frustrated? Mm -hmm. That's a good question to ask. Who, who? Is, who is aware of this frustration? Who is identifying with this frustration? Turn the gaze inward. Just look. Yeah. Who, is, who is there? Right? And that's a thing we can do in every moment. Who is aware of this coming and going we call life? Who hears sounds? Who sees things? Who is aware of tactile sensations? Mm -hmm. Turn the gaze in, observe the observer, watch the watcher, shine the light of awareness onto awareness itself. What's there? Yeah. Give it a try. That question of if I'm talking, who's give listening? That, give it a try in this moment as a quick practice. Mm -hmm. Just observe the observer. Does it have a name, a shape, an age, a gender? Is it young, old? Does it have a biography? I've never been able to pinpoint anything. There's nothing there. And here I thought I was doing it wrong. I'm like, ah. Uh... I did this with a friend of mine. She was just, but there's nothing here. Damned. <laughs> <laughs> and that takes the sting out of it a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. If no one is there, you know, it's just awareness. And the interesting thing with this awareness, it doesn't seem to ever go away. It's consistent. It's like background radiation is always there. Probably all through our lives. Same when we were young. Our bodies have aged and we have all our uh, biographical rubbish that's been accumulating. But awareness is just whew, a constant flow. Eternal presence, stillness. And no one is there. That's brilliant. Right, no historian. Because everything can be there. <laughs> if the glass is empty, it can be full of anything. So that's a good practice to do, actually. I think it was Michael Singer who wrote about it and i think it's an old theravada practice as well i think my friend tarpa mentioned that but uh yeah that, that's a good price for cutting out the crap just who is watching who is feeling stressed who is feeling angry it stops us in our tracks it's like yeah good question yeah <laughs> why is this going on <laughs> why, why am i allowing this to continue right so, so you teach um meditation and other things i assume um, you said specifically in the corporate environment right now, you're doing quite yeah. a bit of that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't consider myself a teacher. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny. I, uh, uh, I consider myself to have a teacher, but he doesn't consider himself to be a teacher either. Uh, <laughs> John Butler, uh, is Christian mystic in England in Bakewell, uh, one of the most impressive people I've ever met. He, um, we were doing a retreat with him uh, last year, uh, and I was walking a bit behind. We did a walk in the countryside, and I was talking to this young guy, and he asked me what I was doing. And you know, yeah, I, I work in corporate, and I teach meditation. And you know, and then John just stops and looks at me. Linus, do you consider yourself a teacher? I was like, well, no. But you know, just as a carpenter, you know, making cabinets, showing someone how to make a cabinet would technically be teaching carpentry, but doesn't make him a teacher. The same way I teach meditation, you know, it's, it's a tool and a skill and I pass it on to people. Oh, good. I'm not a teacher writer. And then continues walking. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. That's, uh, that, that, that's how, how I see it. Not a teacher, but uh, sharing tools and sharing best practices. And I believe this is something everyone have uh, innate in a way. Um, doesn't need anything particularly fancy to utilize it in your life. Uh, don't have to be anyone special and uh, can bring a lot of value. So why, why not share it? Well, I'm definitely interested in uh, spending more time having you share, share this, this type of knowledge and tool set with me. Yeah. Well, at, the, at the one hand, it's, it's knowledge uh, and tool sets. Uh, at another hand, it's, it's uh, uh, non-knowledge or unlearning. Uh, I'll let it go. Because knowledge is accumulation and adding on and building this uh, a mental fort of, you know, total control and being someone and all of that. Uh, th th this is more uh, knowing less and less, in a way. Who is watching? Who is aware? I don't know. 
that's where the rubber seems to hit the road. When you get to that point, they say, I have no clue. That's fantastic. <laughs> I have no idea. Where could this go? What a mystery. It's so ironic how break. simple it is yet. Yeah. When we allow it to be. Yeah. When we don't overcomplicate Boy, it. Boy, I like to make things complex. We, we all do. do. <laughs> that's, that's the curse. That's the human condition. And especially in our modern culture, it's, it's built on it. More and more, endlessly more, it never stops. And I mean, in nature, as far as I know, the only two systems that would be working the same way would be cancer cells and weed. Yeah. And they tend to kill everything around it eventually, crowd it out. Yeah. Uh, and our current system seems to operate the same way. Yeah, it seems to be built on the same foundation. Because it's a bit like drinking salt water. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. It never ends. You just want more. You have a billion dollars, cool, you want two. Oh no, but that guy has five. But you don't have a trillion yet. Comparison. Yeah. Yeah. The thief of joy. Yeah. yeah, very much so. All righty, Linus. Well, thank you so much for uh, making it all the way out from Ireland to uh, come and visit us finally. And no, 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 we're happy to be here. Thanks for having me. This oh. is my first ever podcast. Oh, yeah, amazing. Oh, I love yeah. it. This is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All righty, guys. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Stay elevated. Peace out. <laughs>